Okay. Um, well, first of all, I'd just like to say that I'm actually a, still a, a member of the CFMU as well. I'm a retired member, though, but my whole history as a trade union activist has been with the CFMU and the Teachers Union, um, which is now the AU. Okay, well, I'll bet everyone in this room and online breathed a big sigh of relief on the evening of May 21, 2022. It wasn't that most of us had any illusions that the incoming ALP government was going to change the world. It's just that after 10 years of increasingly horrible right-wing coalition governments, nothing could be so bad. Remember how we all used to cringe and probably spew hatred every time Scott Morrison opened his ugly mouth and said something indecent about refugees, bushfire victims, women, First Nations activists, the unemployed, people with disabilities, the environment while holding a piece of coal, I could go on. But how good was it when he, he and the rest of his right-wing cronies were so unceremoniously dumped from office? And remember how Albanese on the night of the election claimed victory with words like these. I put forward a positive... Put forward a positive clear plan for a better future for our country and I have shared the two principles that will drive a government that I lead. No one left behind because we should always look after the disadvantaged and the vulnerable but also no one held back because we should always support aspiration and opportunity. In other words he claimed to be very principled he was going to look after the working class and give opportunities to the ruling class. In fact, later in the speech, he spelt out this. Together, we can work in common interests with business and unions to drive productivity, lift wages and profits. Once again, that idea that workers and capital have heaps in common if we all work together. Forget that workers at that time had barely had a pay rise for decades and the cost of living was already spiralling out of control while profits soared. Well, tonight we're going to examine Albanese's principles and see how the working class generally, unions, the environment, housing and refugees in particular, have actually fared under the Labor government. I'm also going to make comparisons with previous Labor governments, asking whether they have always been like this. Well, less than 12 months after it was elected, Labor brought down its first budget. It was in the black, had cut $17.8 billion from government agencies and didn't budge on continuing with stage three tax cuts. Clearly a message to capital that they, the ALP, could be relied upon to protect the corporate sector in the event of another crash, like the Great Financial Crash of 2008, as there was plenty of money in the kitty for bailouts. Meanwhile, no significant pay rises for the unemployed and those on welfare. They were offered an increase lower than that allocated by Scott Morrison's government in 2021. There were a few minor social welfare sweeteners, but Labor was tinkering around the edges while window dressing big ticket items, such as the $11.3 billion for aged care workers' wages, to try and sell the idea it was addressing working people's needs. There was almost nothing in the budget to transition away from fossil fuels and carbon emission reductions, and the $368 billion committed to AUKUS nuclear-powered submarines remained. So if we were going to do a tally of Albanese's principles, we'd have to say capital one, the working class zero, but don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And what did the unions have to say about all of this? Let's turn to the ALP National, Secretary, National Conference in August of this year, when we find Sally McManus, ACTU Secretary, worried about record profits during a cost of living crisis, as she should be, but praising Labor for not wasting any time in legislating to improve workers' rights. Indeed, the whole of that conference, where affiliated unions have delegates, was one of compromise. As The Guardian journalist Paul Cutt noticed on August 19 of this year, essentially it's a core Labor value to compromise to get things done. 
Party conference delegates got the memo and compromised they did. Carp noted that Albanese's whole address to the conference was essentially about making lasting change while retaining government for the next decade. Um, but one has to ask lasting change for whom? Every progressive demand that might help our class was pushed off into some deal for a review or for the Never Never Land. Just two examples from left unions. The CFMEU pushed for a super profits tax to pay for housing, but was forced to settle for a vague commitment to funding from a progressive and sustainable tax system, including corporate tax reform. That, that was the solution. Nobody actually knows what it means. <laughs> While the ETU, the Electrical Trades Union, got a promise of supposedly substantial public investment in renewable electricity and expanded state ownership, but this was clouded by the need for hundreds of billions of dollars worth of the implementation investment. So put off for the never, never. There were no policy changes in regards to AUKUS or foreign affairs. Indeed, while the left, which supposedly has the numbers but never unites enough to use them, got to interject during the AUKUS debate, delegates turned around and shouted, join the Greens. The Greens, as always, are the convenient ridicule enemy, and to be honest, we're in that category as well, for all true believers. The CARP concluded Labor's history is one of compromise. Well, it's more than just compromise. Labor throughout its history has always been the other party of capital. As Sam Wainwright said in, in the Green Left of J June 28 this year, since Labor was founded in 1901, it has always promoted a fantasy where workers and big business pull together and everyone gets a fair slice of the pie. <coughs> Labor governments owed their first loyalty, cap loyalty to capitalism, not to their own party or working people. Labor functions as the sugar coating on the poison pill of Australian capitalism. Well, even Lenin, observing from far off Russia in the days before social media, had no illusions in the nature of the Australian Labor Party. Here is a hilarious, often quoted passage from Lenin in 1913. <laughs> way, way back. This is what he said. The parliamentary elections took place in Australia recently. The Labor Party, which had the majority in the lower house, having 44 seats out of 75, suffered defeat. Now it only has 36 seats out of 75. The majority has passed to the Liberals. But this majority is very unstable because in the upper house, 30 of the 36 seats are occupied by Labor. What a peculiar capitalist country is this in which, <laughs> in which Labor predominates in the upper house and recently predominated in the lower house and yet the capitalist system does not suffer any danger. <laughs> he goes on to say, the Australian Labor Party does not even claim to be a socialist party. As a matter of fact, it's a liberal bourgeois party mm -hmm. and the so-called liberals in Australia are really conservatives. Mm -hmm. But he also identified in that little, it's quite, it's quite a short article. If you look it up online, you'll, you'll really get a scream out of it because it's quite hilarious. But he also identifies the leaders of the Australian Labor Party are trade union officials, an element which everywhere represents a most moderate and capital serving element. And in Australia, it is altogether peaceful and purely liberal. <laughs> Ouch. That was 110 years ago. And what's actually changed? changed. <laughs> exactly. Now, worse. that's not to say that all union leaders are actually servants of capital, but they are a bureaucratic layer that is privileged and prone to doing deals that serve the interests of capital more than their own workers. And of course, I'm not saying everyone's like this, but there's a lot of them. Just look at the history of the Australian Workers Union, of whom Bill Shorten, a former national secretary of that union is such a shining example. <laughs> the AWU has always stood by the oil, gas and coal companies. Their support in Geelong, of course, I'm from Geelong, and I was involved in the Viva Energy campaign, and you, you don't need to know all the details, but they're trying to get a gas hub there. 
and it's a seriously unsound and massively polluting gas hub, um, but they supported it because they've got a lot of jobs there. Um, indeed, they bullied Geelong Trades Hall into taking no position on the gas hub because they threatened to get all the blue collars to disaffiliate and trying to stop unions from mobilising to support environmental demands and portrayed greenies as the enemy of workers and the people. Of course, Shorten isn't the first ALP leader to sell out his working class roots. Billy Hughes, Australian Prime Minister during World War I, um, and we're talking 1916 in this particular case, and himself a former AWU organiser, was only too happy to send more Australian workers to their doom and to actually split the Labor Party over conscription when there were no longer enough volunteers stepping forward for their World War I death sentence. Another significant point about this split is that there have been three splits in ALP history, all led by the pro-big business right-wing factions when they couldn't get their own way. The left in the Labor Party never split. It just compromises to avoid a split. Both Albanese and Gillard are examples of this and show why principles mean little. Remember that on the day of Gillard's most important, important feminist speech against Abbott, it was the one that went, I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. I will not. She also cut the single mother's pension. Right. Well, so. so much for sisterhood. There are two other historical examples of ALP history that I want to present, which show clearly how Labor serves the interests of capital. Firstly, there is the 1949 coal miners' strike. It was the first time that soldiers were unions during peacetime to break a trade union strike. The strike by 23,000 coal miners lasted for seven weeks, but the Chifley Labor government broke it by sending the troops in and the workers were defeated as the soldiers scabbed on them. This was despite Chifley himself having a background as an organiser in a railway union that fought Billy Hughes's government during World War I. And indeed, that union was then deregistered by a state Labor government. But that was his background, but you know, 20 years later, all is forgotten. Sorry, 30 years later. The use of troops to break the 1949 coal miners strike was used as a precedent by the Robert Menzies Conservative government to intervene on the waterfront at Bowen, Queensland in 1953 and in disputes in 1951, 52 and 54 against seamen and waterside workers. All of these unions were the most militant of their day. Many had leaderships who were members of the Communist Party of Australia and were reviled as enemies of the people. The ALP knew that they had to challenge the CPA because they might be seen as an alternative to themselves, similar to the vilification of the Greens today and, and the whole left today. Overall, though, it was also a classic example of how Labor changes laws or sets precedents and softens working class responses for much harsher anti-working class attacks from conservative coalition governments. My other example and my last example is what Bob Hawke, a former ACTU leader, was able to do as Labor Prime Minister by introducing the Prices and Incomes Accord in 1983. Now, there's a whole lot of people in this room who'll remember this, <laughs> but there's a whole lot who probably don't know much about it. The, the accord was an agreement between the ACTU and the Labor government. Employers were not party to it, but they gained from it. Under the accord, unions agreed to restrict wage demands while the government pledged to minimise inflation but increase spending on the social wage, uh, which was particularly education and welfare. This never happened, and the accord became a very effective mechanism for undermining union solidarity and the militancy, while also reducing union membership levels and the levels of experienced activists and so on and so forth. Many of the problems that unions face today have their roots in what happened under the accord. Indeed, much of the anti-union legislation still in place now was initiated under the Hawke and Keating governments. The Howard government was then able to bring in brutal attacks 
only halted in 2007 when the left-wing unions, which included ourselves at that time, fought back and led the ousting of the government through the Your Rights at Work campaign. Sam Wainwright, uh, in the same article that I quoted before, explains it this way. In times of crisis, such as war and depression, Labor has been the more reliable manager because it can better restrain the union and the social movements in the name of the national interests. Sam shows that while the Reagan and Thatcher governments in the US and Britain during the 1980s were able to introduce the anti-working class policies of neoliberalism, in Australia, the unions were too strong and a frontal assault risked a backlash. Instead, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating went to work using the infamous Prices and Incomes Accord, which whittled away wages, rights and the welfare system. More recent Labor leaders like Rudd, Gillard, Albanese and most of the state Labor premiers, even the one who retired today, <laughs> were trained during the period of the Accord. And that's why they are so skilled in making it look like they are acquiescing to union and working class demands while doing the opposite. This also partially explains why working class people have illusions in Labor. We're told it's the party of the working class and that many leaders have worked for unions, so they must have our interests at heart. <laughs> also, we see how the Liberals are clearly pro-ruling class, while the Greens are portrayed as middle class hypocrites whose policies are anti-worker. So in answer to one of the questions for tonight, have ALP governments always been like this? My answer is yes, they have. The only principle that Labor has ever abided by is that they must win and maintain power at all costs. For the individuals, they see that winning union positions where they maintain class peace is a career path to becoming an MP. So herein lies the challenge for us. We have to expose the ALP to workers and the sham that their bourgeois governments represent. The honeymoon period is nearly over. Albanese's popula popularity is falling. Two thirds think he's not doing enough to ensure affordable and secure rentals, while three quarters think that the same about the cost of living. Mm -hmm. The problem is that eventually workers swing back to the Liberals mm -hmm. as the only alternative. So we need to be part of helping to build mass alternatives to the left of Labor, posing questions about the nature of capitalist societies and providing real solutions not based on the anarchy of the profit motive. We need to show that capitalism and their left tenants, like the ALP, cannot solve the very serious ecological problems and injustices experienced by billions of people on this planet at the moment. Indeed, They've never been able to provide the necessary solutions. So thank you.